Hello, everybody, and welcome back. Um, and apologies to those of you who were expecting to see uh, Michelle Williams uh, in front of you. Uh, Michelle Williams, who is our Associate Director for Unstructured Data with a particular emphasis on imaging, has unfortunately almost completely lost her voice. And so we have had to do a little bit of program juggling with the help of our speakers in the next session. Um, <clears throat> And um, Michelle has managed to uh, find one of her senior colleagues to help with delivering her talk, provided he uh, arrives from his busy morning clinic in time. So this session is about understanding cardiovascular disease with imaging, um, and we have some fantastic talks ahead of you. But um, before I introduce our first speaker, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Centre's imaging theme. So as you as those of you who were here for the morning session will remember, we have uh, six thematic areas and one of them has a particular focus on imaging, where there is some really uh, fantastic uh, potential for at scale research, but some really knotty challenges to sort out. And so uh, Michelle Williams has um, taken on the task of addressing those challenges. She, supported by the BHF Data Science Centre team, has been busy conducting workshops with scientists, clinicians and members of the public uh, to understand, address and discuss some of those issues. Um, she's also uh, partway through leading a Delphi exercise to work with multiple stakeholders to prioritise which questions cardiovascular imaging should most importantly be used to address. Uh, across the broad range of research that could be conducted. And she's busy exploring, again, with multiple partners, the best mechanisms for linking imaging. Uh, Michelle's also busy exploring mechanisms for linking imaging data to health records data at scale and for conducting federated analyses with imaging data across multiple different geographic areas of the UK and beyond. So I can't really do justice to Michelle's theme and uh, you'll just have to join the next showcase event to hear from her directly yourselves. But in the meantime, we've got some fantastic talks lined up for you. And so uh, without further ado, uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Declan O'Regan. So Declan is an MRC investigator and consultant radiologist. Uh, based at Imperial College and Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, where he's director for imaging and leads the computational cardiac imaging group at the MRC London Institute of Medical Sciences. Um, and he's also importantly uh, involved in the leadership team of the London Medical Imaging and AI Centre for Value Based Healthcare. Uh, Declan is going to speak to us on cardiac imaging across populations. Uh, so over to you, Declan. Great, thanks very much for the, uh, the introduction, Cathy. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about how imaging can be really pivotal um, in our understanding of cardiovascular disease and how we can start to scale up imaging from, from individuals as we would consider them as they come to the department for a test to, to very large populations where we can make inferences about outcomes, inferences about their genetic makeup and so on. So um, a lot of what uh, I'm going to talk about relies on using computer vision techniques to essentially extract uh, machine readable information from, from clinical imaging and to be able to do that uh, at large scale in, in populations from the NHS, but also in the population that's available in UK Biobank, for instance. And I'm going to talk about how we can take those images, we can form a digital model of the heart and we can use mathematical and machine learning techniques to be able to understand the interaction between genetic variation and the structure and motion of the heart, uh, to look at um, uh, the genetics of complex traits as well by considering that the heart is an integrated whole and being able to use uh, techniques for risk prediction uh, and early diagnosis. So I'm going to touch on one uh, technique that um, is under development for predicting outcomes in heart failure. So this is just an example of, of a, a clinical cardiac MRI. It's in two patients who have pulmonary hypertension. So this is a, a relatively uncommon form, but an important form of right-sided heart failure. Now, one of the things that we rely on uh, is the ejection fraction. It's just the percentage of how much blood is pumped out by the heart uh, in each, each beat. And it gives us a rough indication of the sort of pump function. 
But in this case, we have two patients here, they have the same value, 22% of uh, ejection fraction showing severe impairment, but they have very different outcomes. So one patient is alive after four years, the other dies uh, at six months. So I think this points to the, the issue that many of the metrics that we commonly measure aren't very good um, for, for stratifying patients according to risk. So this is potentially something that machines could be very helpful for because they're able to analyze all of the information that's available in these images, uh, which might not be easy for even an expert to, um, to pick up on. So we can use computer vision techniques to basically convert those grayscale images of the moving heart into a, a sort of digital representation. Uh, and we can do this almost in real time with very high accuracy, which is important. Um, and then we can then uh, aggregate data from uh, a large population of, uh, of patients um, by registering them to, to an atlas. So each individual patient may have imaging and sort of different orientations and so on. Um, but we can use these computer vision techniques and these image registration techniques to form a single digital model of the heart. And that's what's shown on the right. This represents the variation in function in the right ventricle across uh, three, 400 patients in this study. So we can then use a relatively simple uh, deep learning algorithm. This is a type of autoencoder and it's sort of bottleneck, bottlenecked shaped uh, in that it's, it's a form of data compression. So we're trying to find simple features in this complex pattern of cardiac motion, three-dimensional motion that are useful for predicting uh, patient outcomes. And you can see the survival curves on the right, um, how well conventional MR parameters discriminate between high and low risk patients. And you can see those lines are much more separated by using this machine learning uh, approach. And it's important to remember this is fully automated. All of this can actually happen even while the patient's having their scan. And then the prognostic information is then presented at the point of, um, of diagnosis or reading of those scans. So that's now part of a, um, a, a study uh, supported by NH NIHR and NHSX of actually seeing how well we can integrate these sorts of algorithms that are very close to the patient. The patient could be having this analysis really at the point of imaging um, and we can present this information to the, to the person uh, analyzing those images at the point of care. And importantly, what this doesn't generate is a lot of difficult to interpret new metrics. It actually gives you a very meaningful uh, stratification that particularly in primary hypertension um, uh, very clearly maps to how aggressively you should treat that patient. What about uh, diastolic function? So we've touched a bit on systolic heart function, but actually the way the heart relaxes and fills is also incredibly important. Um, we see increasing stiffness of the heart muscle in an aging population, in a population with increasing uh, levels of uh, insulin resistance and diabetes uh, and other risk factors, all of which act together to increase the stiffness of the heart. And we know that this diastolic dysfunction complicates many cardiovascular diseases uh, and causes reduced quality of life for patients. But cardiac motion analysis, as I've touched on, uh, is an approach at which we can analyze the way the heart relaxes and fills at scale. So here, for instance, we've scanned or analyzed the images from 40,000 people in UK Biobank. You can see how the computer has tracked the contours of the heart over time. The colored areas show the strain that's in the heart muscle uh, during contraction. But then we can look at the way the heart relaxes as well. So we can then use, um, uh, uh, look at the genotyping that's available in Biobank uh, and look at the common genetic variants that explain the differences um, in diastolic function. And importantly, this has shown up a number of genetic pathways that uh, are important for how the heart responds to, to stress uh, and also could point us towards novel therapies for diastolic dysfunction as well. What about um, the risk associated with carrying a, a genetic defect? Um, so this is an example of images of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, one of the, the leading causes of sudden cardiac death uh, in adults. And you can see the abnormal thickening of, of the heart muscle is characteristic of this. Um, but increasingly people are having genetic screening and uh, for other reasons, direct to consumer or for, for other clinical indications. And of course they're discovering um, these genetic variants that are associated with conditions like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And what advice can we give to patients uh, who ha have a discovery of these genetic variants, but outside of familial disease, which we're more, uh, more familiar with. 
So again, we look in UK Biobank, we find about one in 400 people actually carrying these genes um, associated with HCM. But much more commonly, one in 40 or so actually have a gene defect also in the sarcomeric genes, um, which we're less certain about um, what the, the outcome of that might be. So the good news is the event, the absolute event rate, if you ca incidentally carry one of these genes, is very low. Um, but the incidence of adverse outcomes is about 70% higher. For heart failure, uh, it's almost four times higher. And actually, we can use these computer vision techniques here to show us where in the heart uh, you get thickening of the heart muscle. Interestingly, relatively few of these patients or these you know, people in the community who have these genetic variants actually have a severe enough form of disease that you would label it as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They have a much more attenuated uh, form of, of hypertrophy. So these cases wouldn't be picked up just by, by routine screening. So this sort of approach is very helpful in understanding um, what the significance is, what advice we perhaps should give to patients who have incidental discoveries of these genetic variants. What can imaging do also to understand perhaps some of the um, novel mechanisms of, of heart development and of the transition between having a healthy heart and developing heart failure? So this is just an example really of, of what can be achieved um, using these sorts of concepts. Here we have imaging of the heart um, and a cross section of the heart showing the inner surface of the heart is covered by these fine muscular strands. It's not a smooth surface. And these are tr the trabecchi. We know these are important um, before the coronary circulation is developed. But what role they have in the adult heart hasn't really been clear. But we know these sort of branching fractal patterns are seen all over nature, from the way in which the airways divide through also um, through, through uh, shells and patterns of, of plants and so on. These self-similar patterns are very good at increasing surface area. Um, for, for, for whatever reason, for oxygen transfer or for developmental reasons. So again, in UK Biobank, we use machine learning to analyze the hearts, this time of 20,000 people. We used fractal analysis to see how complex these trabecular patterns were. And then we could use that in the genetic association analysis, again, to see what common genes explain the difference in how trabeculated the heart is. We can also then use those discoveries in human populations to knock out those genes in animal models. We can look at outcome studies to see how important um, those genetic pathways are in predicting heart failure. And we can then move back from human populations to simulations, um, biophysical simulations, to again understand how important these structures are to heart function. So what we found out with these trabeculae, actually, um, they're associated with a number of common variants that actually overlap with cardiomyopathy genes. Um, but they also related to molecular pathways that control the branching of filaments in the heart. So actually the way the heart develops on a molecular scale can be manifest on what you see on a, on a tissue and organ level scale. And they have a function. They're not just sitting there. Uh, they're not vestigial structures. Um, it looks like they improve cardiac performance uh, and are causally related to, to heart failure. So we can use imaging across really diverse populations uh, using these sorts of computer vision techniques and registering to a common atlas space. We can integrate data uh, across very diverse populations and also bring together genetics, biomarkers, clinical data, and information uh, on therapies as well to really accelerate progress towards precision medicine, understanding the mechanisms of heart failure and understanding how genes and our environment both interact together to uh, affect our, our health. Uh, this is all very collaborative work uh, across many disciplines from clinical radiology to genetics, uh, disease models uh, and machine learning. And I'd just like to finish by thanking uh, all of our collaborators uh, at Imperial and beyond. So I'm back to Cathy, thank you. Thank you so much, Declan. Perfect timing. And uh, you win the prize so far for the most beautiful slides. I just, uh, that's so lovely to look at all those lovely images. I've got a big screen up beside me to see them properly. So thank you very much. And anyone who has questions for Declan or any of our other speakers, we'll deal with those at the end of the session. So do please uh, keep them coming in through the questions portal. Um, so um, I'm now delighted to introduce our, our second speaker for this session, Dr. George Cardozo, who's a reader in artificial medical intelligence at King's College London, where he leads research on big data analytics, quantitative radiology and value-based healthcare. 
Um, and like Declan, he's also involved in the leadership team, um, in his case as Chief Technology Officer at the London Medical Imaging and AI Centre. So, um, Georgia, over to you to give us your talk on federated learning and how to bring data to artificial intelligence models. Thank you so much, Cathy. I hope everyone can hear me well. Um, <clears throat> so today's talk is going to really be about federated learning, which is one of the many approaches that you can take to scale research from one single site to multiple sites without the need to centralize data and all of the problems that that can bring. So this all started a few years ago with the Topol report, where one of the key sentences there was, um, up until a few years ago, say data was just sitting there, and now everyone is trying to get data from hospitals, analyzing it, getting insights from it, and creating systems, uh, in this case, AI systems, that can use the patterns that they've learned from the data to make something useful uh, out of it. And if you can learn from all of the data available to you in an hospital setting, you can really start tackling some very key questions that so far uh, have required studies that have taken um, tens of hours, hundreds of hours, thousands of hours to really put together to uh, make sense of the data. Evidence-based medicine as an approach to care has been pretty paramount and is very much accepted nowadays as a de facto standard for healthcare. And AI models are nothing more than the evolution and the ultimate version of uh, evidence-based medicine because they make use of evidence to make these predictions. The current issue that we face with AI models is primarily twofold. There's an issue of how do we deploy them safely and in a way that is ethical. But there's also an issue uh, about how do we make sure that they learn from sufficient data and at scale so that the models do indeed generalize it and they can understand the true underlying patterns rather than something else. So if you are doing classic data science, you want to go basically from uh, the what you see here, uh, like through this process, you first design the study, then you obtain the ethics, then you fetch data from multiple sources, you anonymize the data, you put that data into a centralized location, you clean up, and then finally you enrich that data. Uh, and when you enrich that data, then you can do the research you ultimately wanted to do and uh, maybe start publishing or get insights from that data. And all of these initial steps, these uh, steps of obtaining ethics, uh, fetching data, anonymizing, centralizing, is actually incredibly complicated, primarily when you want to make use of clinical data. If you want to use data from patients, the, uh, the burden of proof in terms of data anonymization and data privacy, the need for consent, all of these other complicated matters can make that process incredibly complicated and cumbersome, which means that we're often limited to research grade data sets for which patients have, have given advanced consent. Uh, and that allows you to then do the research you need to do. But for many of these AI models, that's just not sufficient. We need to scale. And for that, one of the solutions possibly is federated learning. And that's the one we are currently implementing. If you are doing large scale training, what most people have done so far is to create a large centralized medical data set. So they take data from multiple sites, they create local extracts, and those later data extracts go through a series of uh, anonymization processes, um, data curation processes. And after all of this happens, they are sent to a centralized location. The problem is a lot of private data cannot be shared. So sharing this data requires data to be made anonymous. Uh, and that's incredibly difficult, which means many different types of data just cannot be shared because they can never be made anonymous. And actually, anonymizing data, that even the data that we currently consider to be anonymous, is not truly anonymous. It's probably only pseudonymized. And that can cause serious issues uh, when you're using patient data in an hospital setting. The other part is data is an asset. And uh, this idea that the hospitals are keen to share data for any purposes whatsoever is actually quite tricky. We've seen that some hospitals are actually not very keen to open their assets to everyone to explore unless some very specific conditions are met. So being able to make sure that they have contr some control over their own data is important to hospitals and to patients and their carers. And lastly, is very bureaucratic. You need to have many, many data sharing agreements and ethics agreements and um, making sure that every single process is, is really tied up so that you can, you can make sense from it. One way to solve this issue is through the use of federated learning. So really the idea of federated learning is to create a way that rather than sharing data and putting data in a centralized location, the data remains at each one of their sites. And what you do is you will train these AI algorithms to learn from the data at each one of the sites without sharing the data 
but by sharing the algorithm and their parameters. So the idea here is very much like what the human would do. When a clinician is being trained, they normally go through different hospitals and they understand how different hospitals work in different settings. And that gives them an insight of how care should be provided because they can learn from multiple environments. And if you go to hospital A and then go to hospital B, there is knowledge that you keep with you when you move between these sites. The same thing can happen with algorithms. They can share parameters. And by doing so, we can learn from data without ever moving the data around. And that gives you very strong guarantees, both in terms of privacy and, on, and anonymity. There's many ways that you could do this. Uh, the most common way that has been done in the past is something called cyclic learning. So you would train the model on one site, send the model to another site, send the model to another site, and then maybe come back to the first site. So the model will cycle between multiple sites. But they've realized, researchers have realized that if you build a system that connects all of the sites to a single centralized hub, you can actually train algorithms in a fully federated way without cycles, and you can have guarantees of performance as if the data was co-located. So, so they would achieve the same performance as if all the data was in the same place, but the data is actually distributed and non-co-located. And federated learning is incredibly simple. If you are using standard AI algorithms, every iteration that an AI algorithm goes through, there's a model update. And that model update, you can think about it as a delta of the knowledge of the model parameters that the model has learned. So if you can share that model update, then the model updates can be combined and coalesced in a centralized federated server. And then this new model can be sent back to the different hospitals to be updated further. And this iterative process, this what is called federated averaging process, allows you to then train models in a fully distributed way only by sharing the model update parameters. We have one of such system currently in our AI center. At the moment, it is deployed in uh, two different trusts. It, it will be deployed by summer next year in our 10 trusts, which will cover roughly one fourth of the UK population. Currently, it's connecting King's College Hospital and UCLH, and Guys and St. Thomas is going to be next. And the other trusts of the AI center will come uh, just after. The idea is that we have a system that can collect and harmonize data from the clinical um, systems, put it into an in-hospital data lake that is harmonized and interoperable. And then that in-hospital data lake is made available to federated learning algorithms that have gone through an ethics approval process. It allows you to actually go through the full research life cycle from asking the question, applying for ethics. The ethics themselves are appropriate for a federated setting. And there's an, a system where we have a patient-led committee that approves data access uh, with representatives from all the hospitals for which data is going to be donated to the project. And after that ethics approval is done, you can then run your federated learning algorithm without moving from your desk. You don't need to physically go anywhere. Just as a demonstration, uh, one thing that you can do with these models is to learn the data itself. So for example, you could train an algorithm on data from the hospital, and you can actually ask the algorithm to learn what the data looks like so that when you download the model, the model can create data sets that are similar to, but not the same as the ones that the data that the models have learned from. So that means you can create synthetic data that looks like the one in the hospitals, but you can do it in your own machine by learning what the data looks like. That means you have data that looks like the one in the hospitals, but is not real data. It's not real patient data. It doesn't have any anonymization or privacy issues associated with it. You can also demonstrate that if you train these models on certain tasks, for example, in this case is a model that was trained in a federated setting. This is actual live training of data coming from hospitals. You can achieve the same performance as if all the data was co-located and you can achieve very competitive performances compared to state-of-the-art models, even though no data has ever been shared and everything has been trained in a fully federated way. This is not to say that there are no challenges. Um, the system architecture is non-trivial. We need to make sure that uh, initiatives and consortia still exist, right? You can only establish federated networks between people that want to work with each other, and that still needs to happen. And there are some privacy and security concerns that we need to be made aware. So these algorithms can, in theory, memorize some aspects of the data, but there are protections that we are putting in place to make sure that anyone regardless of how nefarious their intent could be, could use these systems without jeopardizing patient privacy. And patient privacy is really an important topic, right? Is 
because these algorithms can memorize what the data looks like, we need to make sure that these protections are in place so that patients feel safe and secure when wanting their data to be used for research purposes because they know and they have confidence in the system that no data is going to leak or their data is not going to become available to someone else without their, um, their express consent. Just to finalize, in terms of impact, um, it does obviously impact doctors because it can improve the accuracy in, uh, of, of these tools and uh, make the decisions less biased. It can improve patients because obviously they benefit from the same accuracy and unbiased, but also because there is a cost reduction if AI systems are in place, which means more care can be provided to patients. Researchers, because they can do collaborations and research at scale and have access to the size of data that they would need. Healthcare providers, because they can make their data accessible while still controlling data by using these FL systems. And lastly, uh, device manufacturers, um, in this case, medical device manufacturers, because they can have algorithms that actually do improve continuously, can make use of the ever-growing amount of data that exists in federated settings. So to conclude, um, federated learning is a way for you to access large-scale data in a way that is accurate, safe, and ethical. And it does provide mechanisms for you to access data in a way that is consistent with governance and privacy limitations that currently exist in healthcare. And techniques like differential privacy can help federated learning achieve really this ideal situation where no data can be leaked and all data, all patient data is protected. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, George. And um, for those of you who do have questions for George, please do submit them through the Q&A channel and uh, we'll pick up on those later. Um, so I'm delighted now to introduce our final speaker for this session, uh, who has stepped in at very short notice uh, as well, uh, but uh, who better really uh, than Mark Dweck, Chair of Clinical Cardiology at the University of Edinburgh and a, a BHF Fellow and Consultant Cardiologist um, at the Royal Infirmary in Edinburgh to speak to us about cardiovascular imaging in 2022. So Mark, hot from your clinic, um, uh, please do uh, uh, tell us about your talk topic. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so um, thank you, Kathy. I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah, I'm afraid I, I'm not Michelle Williams. Um, and so uh, she can't be here today, um, but I, I'm trying to step in and uh, give the talk um, on her behalf. Um, so. Um, we're going to talk about cardiovascular imaging in uh, in 2022 and uh, what that uh, looks like, uh, how we are using imaging in clinical practice and also in the research setting. So um, we're lucky actually uh, to live in an era of multimodality cardiovascular imaging. And for many years, we only really had two tools to look at the heart. One was um, echo and the other was invasive angiography. But now we have a whole bunch of different scanners that we can apply to the heart and each of which give us very powerful information about what's happening inside the heart uh, and the disease pro processes that are, that are going on. So these are the, the scanners that we have uh, in Edinburgh at the moment and uh, these are available in many hospitals, um, particularly the top uh, three. And using these, uh, these types of scanner, we can get very detailed information um, about the heart so we can get uh, beautiful anatomical images of the heart, looking at the structure of the heart. You can see here the coronary arteries sitting on top of the heart muscle, uh, beautiful images. Um, we can also get uh, images about uh, cardiac function. So you can see the heart pumping away here. You can see a, a big uh, uh, sack uh, where a patient has had a heart attack and the heart has ruptured. And uh, we can see also now with molecular imaging techniques, we can look at disease activity as it is occurring in the heart in different disease processes. So really incredibly powerful information uh, that modern scanners can uh, provide. Um, and uh, the challenge now, if you're a researcher or a clinician uh, using this technology, is to work out how best to use these amazing images to actually improve patient diagnoses and crucially uh, patient uh, outcomes. And that's certainly the, the focus of our research uh, that we do in Edinburgh, but also um, across the UK. Um, <clears throat> so I've kind of structured the, the talk into two parts. The first is to briefly overview the types of scanners that uh, we have and what they can tell us in a bit more detail. And the second is about the types of studies that we can do in imaging um, to try and improve outcomes and diagnoses. 
So um, if we first uh, talk about the type of imaging, well, as I said, we've got lots of different uh, scanners available. So the trick now is really to try and pick the right scan uh, for the question that you have at hand. Now that might be a clinical question, you know, how can I best answer the, uh, the clinical question, the diagnosis of this patient in front of me, what scan would be best? Or it might be a research question, how can I best uh, answer this interesting research question? And, and the trick, as I said, is to pick uh, the best imaging test to answer that question. So um, the, really the first line imaging test in most situations still uh, is echocardiography and, and this is ultrasound uh, imaging. It's uh, cheap, it's um, widely available and it's fast. Um, I think its greatest advantage now is its portability. So uh, these are the, the uh, scanners we used to have to wheel around the hospital uh, imaging patients but now uh, you get uh, handheld echocardi uh, echocardiography machines. You can plug in probes to your smartphone, to your uh, iPad, and you can uh, you can do these scans readily um, uh, in patients uh, in the hospital, but also potentially outside of the hospital in their in their home setting. And I think because of this portability, I think Echo has actually got an extremely exciting future um, because of uh, how easy it is to do these scans. Um, it doesn't involve any radiation. Um, there are huge databases of echocardiograms across the UK. Uh, most hospitals will have an echocardiogram uh, database. So, uh, and because it's the first line imaging test, you know we have data across all sorts of different uh, cardiovascular conditions. Uh, and crucially, the technology is advancing rapidly, both in terms of image quality and in terms of making these uh, echo scanners uh, smaller and more portable. Um, so, the other tool that we use a lot clinically uh, is CT and um, the great advantage of CT is that it provides very detailed anatomical uh, imaging with really excellent spatial resolution. So we can see structures in the heart in fine detail and in particular we use it to look at the coronary arteries and the heart valves. Um, the, the slight issue with it is that there is a radiation uh, dose associated with it these doses are relatively small and they're decreasing, but they're not, uh, they're not zero. And so we have to be wary about multiple scans in a patient's lifetime. Uh, but nevertheless, this is increasingly being used in clinical practice uh, and in, in research purposes as well. Um, in terms of looking at the heart muscle, probably the, the gold standard technique is uh, MRI scanning. Uh, we talk about cardiovascular magnetic resonance, but that's essentially MRI. And that's really good at looking at the heart muscle and in particular how it's functioning, how it's pumping. But also we can look at the structure of the heart muscle and crucially see if there's evidence of scarring in the muscle. And so we can use patterns like uh, images like this to look to find scar which appears white versus the normal muscle which appears uh, healthy and black in these images. Uh, and we can look at other things. We can look at iron loading, we can look at edema, all sorts of ways of characterizing the, the tissue uh, in the heart. Um, so this is particularly good at looking at the heart muscle. Um, and then finally we've got uh, molecular imaging techniques. So this is really state-of-the-art stuff. Um, most commonly we use PET imaging uh, either combined with CT or combined with MRI. And uh, in short this tells us about disease activity. So we can fuse it with the structural information from CT or MRI and on top of that we can work out about uh, disease activity. Now, this is not used all that much in clinical practice. We use it in uh, occasional uh, cases of cardiac sarcoidosis or endocarditis. Um, but uh, it is being increasingly used in the, in the research setting. And um, as I said, what it, it tells us about is disease activity. And we can potentially look at any disease process that we might be interested in, subject to the availability of a, an appropriate uh, radio tracer. And the exciting thing about it is that we now have radio tracers uh, that cover most of the disease processes occurring in cardiovascular disease. So we can look at inflammation, we can look at calcification, we can look at thrombus formation, we can look at fibrosis. Um, for many years we were limited just to assessments of inflammation. So I think this is going to be an increasingly used um, tool in the research arena and potentially in the clinical arena. Now what about the types of imaging studies? So how can we use these different modalities uh, to try and improve uh, patient diagnosis and care? 
Um, and so, I mean, the obvious thing is, is studies that look at new techniques to see if it's better at diagnosing a particular condition uh, than another technique. So uh, one recent example is uh, a, a condition called aortic stenosis, where for many years we've used echocardiography to try and uh, diagnose that. And in the majority of cases, that's an excellent tool. But in about a quarter of patients, the echo um, gives us uh, unclear information as to whether the patient has severe disease or not. And that's important because that that uh, differentiation is what we use to trigger surgery. So uh, to overcome that, CT uh, techniques have been developed and we can do studies where we look at the diagnostic accuracy of these techniques uh, versus uh, the current gold standard and uh, either show that it's equivalent or, or uh, not. So uh, a key part of imaging is diagnosis and uh, there's lots of studies looking at new ways to improve diagnostic accuracy. Um, we can also look at risk prediction because the features that we see on imaging might predict what happens to patients in the future. And so there's lots of studies um, looking at uh, cardiac MRI and looking at scar in the ventricle. And across almost all these studies, if you've got scar, that predicts a worse outcome in the future. And so there's now the next uh, set of studies trying to use that information to see if we can improve patient outcomes by using the scar to change uh, management decisions. Um, and then finally, increasingly, as you'll all be aware, there, there's a lot of studies uh, looking at machine learning and how we can we apply that to imaging studies. So there's a huge wealth of information in these scans that uh, goes beyond what we can interpret as, as humans. And so the question is, can we use uh, AI and computers to help us get all the information out from these scans? And so we can use radiomic approaches the team in Oxford are really leading the way, looking at uh, information about the fat around the coronary arteries. And we can also use uh, AI to kind of improve the statistical methods that we use to analyze the data. There's been several recent studies looking at that. And then finally, uh, we can do randomized control trials. So we can do trials seeing whether the application of a specific imaging test actually improves patient outcomes. And this is uh, the Scott Hart trial uh, led by David Newby and essentially this this study showed that if we use the CT scan to assess patients with chest pain we can actually reduce their risk of having a future heart attack so just the simple act of an imaging test can improve patient outcomes and that's because we can use the imaging test to guide therapy to the right patient more uh, targeted pa uh, patient therapy personalized med personalized uh, medicine so I think this there's a great need in imaging to do these trials to show that it's beneficial for patients to spend all this money on imaging and to justify the costs uh, involved. So in conclusion, I think cardiovascular imaging is a powerful and rapidly uh, developing uh, research and clinical tool. Uh, there's rapid advances in scanner technology and trace development accompanied by the powerful information we get from AI. Um, and uh, there's a lot of research in this area and the UK is uh, leading a lot of it. Um, we need further research to work out how best to use this technology and improve patient care. Thank you very much. Terrific, Mark. Thank you very much. And thanks to all three of you for some uh, really uh, exciting uh, and informative talks. So we do have a few questions coming through. Um, so first of all, uh, one for Declan. Um, Declan, uh, it's really great to see the mixture of partners, including different industry players who you've involved in your research, and notwithstanding that, that much of what you were presenting is using consented data from the UK Biobank, um, could you comment on any lessons about how you can make relationships as trustworthy as possible to support this sort of stuff? Yeah, uh, I mean, that's um, that's a really good question. So. So we have used data from very diverse sources. So, you know, we, we use data from um, NHS sort of biobanks. Um, often these are generally patients who have been consented to join a registry, for instance. Um, also other large anonymized registries, both in, in the UK and abroad, um, as well as UK Biobank, of course, which, you know, um, is all effectively anonymized data available at scale. I think having those collaborations with industry has been, you know, fantastically liberating in many ways, particularly in accelerating progress towards 
development of drug targets because that's something that's not expertise that we sort of have within our team, but actually has kind of come from um, some of the discoveries that, that we have we have made using our genetic association analyses and so on. Um, and also reaching out to other collaborators um, more widely in, in the computer vision space. So, so really, I think it's it's a you know it's a really exciting opportunity using these sorts of big resources to bring together lots of diverse teams to work together on sort of solving some of these you know really important problems um, in healthcare. Great, thank you very much indeed. And uh, some questions for George about federated learning. So uh, perhaps I'll wrap a couple up into one question. So when it comes to um, uh, bringing algorithms uh, between different federated systems. Um, what's your experience about working with industry and uh, have you encountered any reluctance to provide algorithms through that kind of federated approach, um, even when they're ensconced within a virtual containers? And then secondly, um, could the information contained within any of these algorithms ever be potentially identifiable? So for the former question, um, we are working with companies and there are companies which are uh, quite strict about their IP. <clears throat> there are ways that you can train models in a federated setting without the owners of the federated learning infrastructure being able to actually have access, any access whatsoever to the IP that is inside of these containers. So there are ways that you can encrypt the models and train models that are encrypted so that no one can see what these models are but they can still learn from the data. So that the technology exists. We haven't encountered many situations. There's only one company that is like this. Uh, all the other collaborators are happy to just have that IP um, being used because they have a contractual agreement with all of the different trusts. And they believe that the trusts are going to fulfill their contractual obligations of not exploiting the IP and stealing things, right? I mean, hospitals are quite reliable uh, legal entities. So that's really not an issue. From the side of data privacy, there is a concern that models could memorize data too much. But again, there is a full field of research called differential privacy, which allows you, gives you tools that allows your models to learn from data in a way that, the, that they cannot memorize uh, specific instances of the data, which means they are guaranteed to preserve privacy. Obviously, privacy is a slippery slope. Uh, you need to be able to learn something from the data to be able to extract knowledge from it, right? That's, in, that's implied in learning from data. And that means that there's always some degree of privacy breach. Obviously here, what I'm trying to say is that we can protect the individual completely using differential privacy settings, but there are some characteristics of the group which cannot be protected because that's the information we're trying to learn. So as long as privacy here means individual privacy, absolutely. Uh, if it means group privacy, no, because that's the point of learning a pattern from a group, right? Every time we're getting even something as simple as the average height of a population, we're learning something about the group, which could be seen as a breach of privacy. So technically, yes, there are solutions to both of those questions. Uh, that's really helpful, George. Thanks very much. And a quick final question for Mark. Um, so, Mark, as a clinical cardiologist, do you have uh, a preference for one of those modalities? What would you use most in clinical practice? And a, a supplementary question from the same uh, source was, uh, is MRI more accurate than the other diagnostic modalities? So, um, that's like a, a difficult question to answer as a multi-modality imager, you get in trouble from all sorts of sides if you pick one. Um, so I think they, you know, the truth is they all have different strengths and weaknesses in the, and as I said before, if you can pick the right test for the right patient, then that's the, that's the key to the future of imaging. I think the test that I use the most is echo because that's, that's the first line imaging test for most situations. Uh, is MRI the best? It depends what the question is. Uh, it's very good at looking at the heart muscle. It's not very good at looking at, uh, the coronary arteries, for instance. So it depends on the question you're answering as to which is the best technique. I'll not get in trouble if I pick a middle road. That was a super diplomatic answer and, and <laughs> clinically entirely appropriate, I'm sure, Mark. Thank you very much indeed. So um, we we had to, another uh, another few uh, questions, but unfortunately, um, 
Uh, well, fortunately, for those of you who want to hear about trials, it's time to move on to the next session. So I'm delighted to hand over to chair the next session uh, to my colleague, Professor Matt Sides. And I want to thank all the speakers um, and those who addressed, addressed and answered questions um, in the previous session. Thank you. Thank you, Cathy. That was a great session, wasn't it? I learned a lot there. Absolutely fascinating. Look, hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Matt Sides. Much of the time, I'm Professor of uh, Clinical Trials and Methodology at the MRC Clinical Trials Unit at UCL. But a day a week, I'm seconded to the BHF Data Science Centre to be the Associate Director for Data Enabled Trials. So let's just bring up the slides if we can. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the work that we're doing. Are they being seen? Perfect. Okay. So why should the Data Science Centre have a focus on clinical trials in the first place? And really, that comes out of what makes clinical trials different to other forms of research, because there are differences, different challenges. And firstly, we see clinical trials in many ways, the gold standards for evidence-based medicine for testing treatments. The trials are run within a complex regulatory framework, particularly investigational medicinal product trials. Actually, the findings may directly impact on future healthcare provision for participants as a route to be seen by regulators, by provisioning bodies to uh, interpret the findings. We have allocation of treatment. It's set out you know, what people are going to be taking in trial. In most trials, that will be done at random as well, between two or maybe more than two treatments. We have consent taken uh, to participate in the research. These are people who know that they're participating in the research with some very small but notable exceptions. We have strict follow-up protocols. People are going to be seen, hopefully, in a standardised way on both arms of a trial. And that data will be collected prospectively. We're talking about getting new data in rather than data that we already have. And we have strict reporting standards as well. And it's worth bearing in mind that really clinical trials are the only way to testing treatments that are not already in use. I know there's some things that we can do with real world data retrospectively. And we should bear in mind that phase three trials may require hundreds or thousands of participants, um, uh, tens or hundreds of participating sites, it may take three to 10 years to get an answer and cost us millions of pounds. So any way we could make a saving or be more efficient has to be a good thing. Now, let's talk about healthcare systems. There's considerable data, there's considerable overlap between the data that we need for clinical trials and the data that's already collected in healthcare systems data sets, those national data sets or collated registries. I mean, it makes sense that there would be that overlap, but at the moment, we take an approach of pulling the data from different places. So appropriate use of healthcare systems data could reduce that duplication of effort, could produce a simple transcription errors at one end or the other could improve other aspects of quality, like, like the completeness of data, if you can get the data in a timely enough way. It should reduce the um, level of monitoring, or at least change the way that sponsors monitor trials, perhaps allowing a greater focus on the data and systems that actually need attention. And overall, this should allow us to reduce the cost of trials, or another way, allow us to do more research within the same funding framework overall and hopefully it will reduce the burden on patients. And of course, there's actually a risk in not using healthcare systems data. You may have missed events if people end up at a different hospital. So what are we doing in the data enabled trials theme? Well, my vision is that within five years, you'll all be thinking about a data enabled approach as, approach as a default position for every new cardiovascular, broad cardiovascular disease trial in the UK. And the aim of the Data Science Centre is to streamline the use of routinely collected healthcare data for trial monitoring, for recruitment, for trial planning, recruitment and follow up. And it's an interesting area because there's sceptics out there, aren't there? People who say you can never get the data or the data out of date. Or when you do get the data, they're unusable. And there's a number of true believers who tell you why you're still collecting data on, on paper or typing it into a database when surely we should be doing this already. And the truth at the moment lies somewhere in between those, which is why it's an area ripe for guidance and for research. So how will we achieve this? Well, what we want to do is increase the number of cardiovascular clinical trials uh, using routinely collected healthcare uh, data sets. And there's five broad areas we've put that into. Why those five? Well, this comes partly out of a, a workshop that HDI UK led with CPRD and NIHR a couple of years ago now, but the paper in BMJ Open came out just last summer 
with a series of recommendations that fit in here. It builds out from the, our own survey that we ran last spring that many of you will have participated in about the current challenges and the in-depth workshop that we did with the cardiovascular surgery folk in October, the report for which has just gone off for signing and should be out very soon. So what are we going to do in each of these areas? Well, firstly, we want to provide you with guidance. We want to make things easier to navigate for you. We want to provide independent guidance to help trial teams navigate the process of gaining access to and using data. And we want to help you understand clearly what data sets are available to you. <clears throat> Come talk to us. We're having a number of discussions <clears throat> and we really want to talk to people about what they're looking to do and why they're looking to do it. <clears throat> we want to develop best practice here, establish ways of accessing and using healthcare systems data that can really impact clinical trials going forward. So we need to be able to en enable shareable lessons from those trials that have accessed <coughs> successfully used healthcare systems data. We started to pull together some narrative case studies on cardiovascular trials with the interns last summer, and we need to build on those, complete those and start to build a, a catalogue. A national catalogue would be helpful, but we think we can start that in the cardiovascular area. We want to use leverage our ability here to improve processes. So we want to contribute meaningfully to discussions to usher in the wider use. Cathy and I, if we weren't here today, we would be the Digitrials user group, uh, which is meeting at this exact moment this afternoon. Uh, Lee Me will be there as well, I presume, to um, uh, where we'd be influencing what they do. And a key thing for me, and th th we were speaking to uh, Nilesh the other day, influence funders into thinking and helping applicants think about routinely collected healthcare data and think it's okay to be using. And think about the funding challenges. At the moment, you only get one bite at the funding cherry, really. And we need to make sure that they can do this in the right way. Costs that are that your app, uh, quotes that are durable or a chance to come back and get the quote later on. We want to uh, develop standard outcome measures and define code lists, define the best practices for doing this, identify the code lists that are out there already. Really say, how do you define outcome measures that use only electronic health records, use these healthcare systems data? What are the codes? How do we combine them? What are the uh, what are the ingredients in the recipe and how are you going to how are you going to sort of bake that cake? Um, and there's a number of ways to do this. This is work across phenomics and trials, but really important to us. We've just started this. We're provisionally calling it SCORE CVD about standardizing uh, outcomes here. But I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a second. And of course, as Lynn suggested earlier, targeted driver project activity, you know, enabling evidence that will support routinely collected healthcare data. And this is a place where we can be doing SWOT studies within a trial. We can do this to check the agreement between trial specific data collection and healthcare systems. There's some SWOT comparisons in literature. Sarah Blake and Rod Stables put one out a couple of years ago for HEAT PPCI, Charlie Harper and the Ascend team, uh, just uh, not 2019, it's 2021. Um, put out results from Ascend. And my PhD student, Siam, has a protocol, a uh, systematic review protocol to pull these together in a review format, but there's very few out there. So if you know of any unpublished, unfinished comparisons, talk to us about it. Help us to help you get those out there. So if you've got the potential to do that comparison, is there something we can be doing to help? So how could you get involved? Because we want you to be involved in the work that we're doing here. Come talk to us, discuss your applications, talk to us about your potential costings and, and let us try and play a role in inputting to that. Share your experiences with us and help us share your experiences onward in using and applying for healthcare systems data. We can co-develop narrative case studies with you. Talk about your needs with us. For score CVD, let us know about those phenotyping algorithms you already use with healthcare systems data sets. And we'll be looking for people from across the community to join expert data uh, groups soon, expert groups soon. And these SWOT projects, tell us about those data utility comparisons that you only have an abstract form or are sitting in your desk drawer. Help us to help those flush that out. So that's a vision here that we're looking to. We're looking to move on to be able to use this in an evidence-based way. We're doing this not alone, but with other people, because that's a way we need to learn with and learn from others. And for that reason, I'm delighted to have two speakers with us this afternoon from outside of the cardiovascular disease world who are going to be talking about experiences of using routine data in trials. We're talking about trials that have used uh, routine data. So Limi Yu from Oxford will be talking about the principal trial in COVID-19. But first, you have Alex Gentry Maharaj from UCL, who's going to be talking to us about the ovarian cancer screening trial, UK CTOX. So 
Alex, may I welcome you? Please. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Matt, and thank you to the committee for inviting me to share the data uh, with the group this afternoon. So what I will be doing over the next 10 minutes or so, talking to you about the use of routine health data in trials from the UK CDOX perspective. And before I start, I just want to say I'm uh, presenting this on behalf of the entire team. As you can see from the photo on the first slide, that uh, uh, it's a large uh, uh, number of individuals uh, that has have, have really contributed to this effort uh, at the helm uh, with Professor Usha Menon, uh, indebted for her mentorship for. 19 years and uh, must uh, mention Dr. Andy Ryan, uh, who I believe may be in the audience, uh, who has really been key and had the oversight of the data linkage and all the challenges that that may have brought. So, um, if we go to the next slide. I think the record clicker is not. Okay. So, the what I'll be talking to you, it's about uh, an, a routine uh, collected health data and uh, interchangeably using registry data or uh, uh, electronic health record data or EHR and uh, what uh, uh, would uh, uh, be uh, Apologies. Uh, and so what I will be uh, doing is talking about the scale and the uh, sorry, yes. So uh, apologies for this. So uh, looking at the scale and uh, the data that's collected in real time and data collected from many to apply to an individual. So why do we use a routinely collected health data in trials? It's really for design of trials, for recruitment, for ascertaining outcomes and follow-up, and economics and looking at healthcare usage. And the data sources I'll be talking uh, about are the data sources that we have used in UK CDOC. So mainly the cancer registration data, the death registry data, the National Cancer Registration and Analysis Service, or formerly NCIN, uh, or uh, currently NCRAS, and uh, the uh, 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 linkage to the Myocardial Ischemia National Audit Project, or MINAP, the linkage that we've had up to 2010. And then looking at uh, the data or the trial being uh, uh, being uh, located in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, we also uh, connected to the Northern Ireland Cancer Registry and uh, uh, for the death data to the Business Services Organisation in Northern Ireland. But the key stages of the data life cycle is that from the hospital system all the way to the NHS uh, uh, digital warehouse, uh, uh, the data is undergoing processing, curation, and then linkage and extraction, which means that it is really collected in real time. The death registration, as it is a legal requirement in the UK, it's registered very uh, quickly within uh, five days uh, of the death. And uh, in a way, if we are working with trial data, this is probably the, time, the most timely uh, source of data that we could be uh, accessing. So what I'll go uh, on uh, and describe some real life examples of the use of such data and in early detection in screening trials where we uh, need to uh, really be looking and uh, uh, confirming the uh, diagnosis of cancer as well as the death due to the specific cancer. Uh, uh, the uh, EHR data can help us with ascertaining outcomes, but also enhancing the value of the data and uh, uh, the samples that have been collected during the trial. So uh, UK CTOX or the United Kingdom Collaborative Trial of Ovarian Cancer Screening uh, was a randomized control trial of 202,000 participants, half of whom were randomized to the control arm and the other half either to screening with uh, annual CA125 interpreted using the risk of ovarian cancer algorithm, the multimodal group or transvaginal ultrasound uh, in the uh, ultrasound group. 
So the women underwent screening for uh, 7 to 11 years uh, until the end of 2011, and the primary outcome was uh, ovarian cancer mortality. But what was key to UKC talks was that NHS number was available for each woman uh, when uh, she was recruited and randomized to the trial. And that allowed that all uh, the women uh, in the cohort were linked through the cancer and death registers. All but eight women who were able to flag throughout this. I'm not going to go and talk here about the screening strategies, but just to give you uh, an idea of really the NHS number had allowed us to connect various data sources. Each woman had given a blood sample at recruitment and then annually in the multimodal group. But throughout all of this time from 2001 onwards, the women had had multiple interactions with the healthcare hospital admissions, cancer diagnosis, and unfortunately, some women would have died. The primary outcome uh, that we reported in 2016 was death due to ovarian and fallopian tube cancer. And as you can see here, um, uh, highlighted in yellow, the ICD-10 codes that we've used uh, and inter interrogated the EHR data to ascertain the ovarian cancer diagnosis and deaths due to uh, the disease. So this was primary site uh, based on the WHO 2003 criteria. So for each of the women, we had uh, notifications from uh, the uh, various data sources I described. And in addition to that, uh, in dark gray, we had direct uh, contact from the participant, from the regional center staff and uh, through postal follow up. And these are the uh, ICD-10 codes that we interrogated to ascertain the ovarian cancer diagnosis and death. The trial uh, implemented an independent outcomes review, the gold standard, where the trial specific notes were retrieved for each of the women diagnosed uh, with potential ovarian cancer and the uh, independent outcomes review committee uh, looked at the uh, notes and assigned a primary cancer site stage and grade and also type 2 uh, whether the ca cancer was type 2 cancer and this is very important in uh, ovarian cancer uh, as uh, type 2 cancers account for most of the ovarian cancer mortality there was a death review form for each of the uh, uh, women who had unfortunately passed away so the primary outcome that we reported in 2021 uh, was death due to ovarian and fallopian tube cancer. And as you can see here, we have two uh, ICD-10 codes, and that is because of the primary site and the WHO 2014 lead classification of primary peritoneal cancer under ovarian cancer. The stage uh, classification was also updated in 2014 and uh, all the uh, uh, stage uh, that uh, was available for the women by the end of the trial was uh, restaged using the figure 2014 criteria. So uh, if I go on to some of the comparisons we've done uh, of uh, the uh, cancer and death registers versus the gold standard of the outcome review, so when we looked at the completeness uh, of uh, uh, cancer and death registers and uh, hospital episode statistics for ovarian cancer, we found that hospital episode statistics adds value in providing cancer data in a more timely fashion. Looking at the independent outcomes review and the uh, final mortality results. So um, uh, very disappointing for our team and for the women. Uh, we did not uh, uh, find benefit with screening, uh, no benefit uh, on uh, mortality uh, uh, of the, uh, in the general population. We uh, carried out the sensitivity analysis uh, using electronic health records alone, and we found no uh, difference. So the central outcome review is very time consuming. It does add value uh, in the accuracy of diagnosis and also obtaining data on stage and grade and the reclassification that I alluded to. We early on in the trial compared self-reported cancer history with cancer registry data and what we found that the concordance of cancer registry with self-reported cancer is high and highest in breast cancer. 
for uh, breast cancer, looking at comparisons to the histological confirmation of diagnosis, we find that the registration in England and Wales for breast cancer is reliable. And we did a similar comparison in colorectal cancer, uh, where uh, we also uh, confirmed the reliability of cancer registry data and that HES can supplement the uh, uh, timeliness of the cancer registration. So data is uh, uh, available through HES earlier than in the cancer registry and self-reporting is less reliable. So we've used the EHR or registry data in early detection uh, of cancer, so in uh, translational research. And here I just uh, provide some examples of uh, ovarian cancer and some of the publications uh, uh, in this uh, discovery of novel biomarkers. Uh, have done work in breast cancer and colorectal cancer. So these are just uh, very few examples of the breadth of the work that has uh, been done over the last 20 years. By connecting to MINAP and using the HES and DEATH data, we were able to identify coronary heart disease events and contribute to the UCLEB consortium. So, Using the EHR data, we have been able to enhance the value of the samples and data. We have established many collaborations and we've led some of this work and there have been over 65 papers uh, resulting from this effort. The uh, 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 bioresource uh, is currently rebranded as the UK CTOX, a longitudinal women's cohort and the uh, collaborations are ongoing. So, the lessons learned uh, from the data uh, over the past uh, 20 years uh, is that in ovarian cancer screening, the using uh, of uh, EHR data alone would have uh, led to the same uh, final mortality result, but uh, using the gold standard has improved the accuracy of diagnosis and we were able to reclassify the primary outcome based on the latest WHO criteria and restage by the latest uh, FIGO. Uh, criteria. Death data, as I mentioned, is very timely as it is a legal requirement to register death within five days and maybe just uh, a word of caution if we uh, are looking at uh, uh, translational research and fatal events that, uh, uh, regarding the original underlying cause of death versus multiple uh, causes of death codes. With regard to timeliness, the HES data can supplement cancer registration data. So, with this, I hope that I have given an overview of uh, uh, UK CTOX, what is the, I guess, the UK CTOX pers perspective, what we have done uh, over the last uh, 20 years and how we have uh, used and where EHR data has been key in ascertaining the outcomes, uh, but also uh, uh, really uh, the wealth of translational research, not just in ovarian cancer, but in other cancers. So, on last but not least, I'd like to thank the participants who have taken uh, uh, um, part uh, in this trial, their generous contribution of their time and effort, the funders, uh, NIHR, uh, the EVA Peel, uh, uh, MRC, CAUK, Department of Health, uh, Bath and UCLA Charities, and uh, of course the entire team that I'm presenting on behalf of. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That's great. It's a huge amount of work there. Lots of people participating. You managed to collect and connect together a lot of different data sets. I'm sure there's questions from the audience. You have the link, same link as before. Any questions you have for Alex, put them in the chat now and we'll come to those in a second. Any questions you have for Lee Mee as we go through as well, please do. So let me welcome Lee Mee from the University of Oxford, who's going to be talking to us about the experiences in the principal trial. Lee Mee, welcome. Over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I know what I'm doing uh, with my uh, slides. Everything is somebody who is going to be uh, doing the forward. For there me, should be a or... small clicker, but if not, I think the team will be able to do that for you. OK, um, I don't know where that's anyway, that's fine. It will be good if you can just do the, the next slides for me, please. Uh, my name is Lee Yu and I am uh, working as a 
sort of, um, my background is a uh, statistician by training, and I'm a lead statistician and also the deputy director of the clinical trials units, as said. And uh, I'm also the lead statistician currently uh, of the principal trial, as you can see, which is where the website is that you will hopefully be able to see. Uh, you know, there's more information about it. And this is the uh, the talk that I'm going to give. It's more about the, the experience that we had being sort of like using the routinely collected data to run the uh, this clinical trials. Uh, next slide, please. So um, this trial is uh, actually has been running since uh, 20, oh, um, before that, before that. Uh, okay. So this slice is actually, um, this, this trial has actually been running for two years now. Today is actually the day that we've marked the, the second anniversary of the start of the principal trials. So this is the day that we actually have our first TMG meeting about the trial. Uh, so this is when the, uh, two years ago, when the pandemic started and this trial was also sort of like the time that we actually have to put together very quickly, less than three months, uh, three weeks in order to, to get the trials up and running. So we started, uh, today two years ago and uh, we've managed to randomize our first patients around the 4th of april so which is actually quite remarkable the trial the purpose of the trial is mainly to evaluate uh, any of the repurposed drugs that can be actually used to help to treat patients uh, with uh, covid 19 symptoms um next slide please so the study itself, this is what I call the PICO uh, trial, which uh, you can actually see what the um, the patient populations that we're looking at is basically the people who are actually have uh, COVID symptoms uh, are, are within the 14 days of onset. And uh, also that is either above 65 or 50 to 64 when, uh, that they have some listed uh, comorbidities. And um, this trial was actually having quite a different in, basically this is sort of like the broader inclusion exclusion criteria, but there are actually other in, inclusion exclusion criteria to go with when you when we're actually testing different drugs at different times. So this intervention, it started with hydroxychloroquine. This is probably the, the drugs that was talked about at that time. And that was the first drug that we started to, 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 uh, to, to test. And the uh, the comparators is actually usual care because of the size. Well, because this is a platform trial, which means that there's going to be very different types of treatment that's coming along. And it's actually quite hard to try to get some placebos, you know, in time you know, uh, during this time. And we feel that it's probably we'll just have to do with what's actually, you know, what the, the usual care is going to be. So it's an open uh, a label study just because of the time that we wouldn't be able to get any of the placebo in time, which I think that's also because of the nature of the trial design. And the primary outcome is a co-primary outcome, and, the, and it's the time to recovery from randomization, which is a question they usually ask a patient to see whether they're actually recovered or not on that day, and also hospitalization or death due to COVID-19. Uh, by the 28 days. So that's two uh, primary outcomes we were looking at. And the sample size was actually estimated to be 400 per group, per arm. Um, that was actually based on the the proposed sample size, but we did actually ended up have some people actually being randomized more due to because of the nature of the adaptive design uh, study. Uh, and also it depending on you know the design, the study, whether it's actually going to meet the threshold or not. Uh, for superiority or futility. Next slide, please. So I think most of people now by now have actually heard quite a lot about platform trials and there's a quite a lot actually in the market, uh, you know, compared to sort of like 10 years ago, you probably just only heard of like Stampede or something, but now it's, there's actually, it's becoming more and more increasingly. And um, there are three trials that's actually running in the UK that's our platform trials. Recovery is probably the one that you heard quite a lot on. And recently we also have started uh, the trial uh, panoramic, uh, but principal trial is the one that we, we, we kind of sort of like started off with. And it's actually the one that we actually learn quite a lot from it in order that we can actually help us to design the panoramic trial better as well. Next slide, please. 
So conventionally, this is what happened is that when you're looking at the uh, trials that are running in primary care, you would actually have to set up some GP sites uh, from the uh, uh, from the trials, and then you would probably get the GP to you know do the listings, trying to find whether there's any sort of like the what we call the top level uh, 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 eligible uh, participant. Then they will send up the text and ask them whether they would be if they have symptoms, would they be actually interested to enroll to the trial, etc. Then they will actually go on to the uh, internet to screen themselves. Then the information will get passed to the GPs, and the GP will sort of like confirmed based on their medical records, everything, and see whether this person uh, this person is actually truly to be, that is actually eligible to be randomized. And the drug would actually be sent by the GP as well to, you know, to the participant. They were probably um, uh, giving out to them and the, um, the, the, the GP practices. And you can see sort of like on the, the, the slides, sort of like the graph and the next bits that you can see where the recruitment is. I think that uh, you might think that it's actually quite good that, uh, you know, in about sort of like two months in the trials that we've randomized 397, we're actually, this is way lower than what we would actually anticipated. We're actually hoping that we can actually open about 840 GP um, sites, you know, within sort of like a very short time period. But by two months, we, you know, the end of sort of like 31st of May, we still probably have just under 400 that so we've actually, you know, just over 400, I would say half over half that we've actually have managed to open the site. So the recruitment is actually much slower than, I would use the word slower than what I thought would be, what we hope. Um, um, so so this is sort of like uh, why, why that uh, I would actually be slightly a bit nervous about this. Next slide, please. So um, can, you, can you maybe just uh, go forward and click again and again? Okay, thanks. So that uh, this is what we actually happened then, is that we actually started with GP's uh, uh, sites, uh, working at them, but and then we actually started to sort of like spreading out and trying to find a way that we can actually, instead of having uh, the, the, the GP practice going reaching out the patients, but we're actually trying to get the patients to come in as well. So we're actually trying using different kind of recruitment routes to help to, to, to boost the recruitment. But one of the things that we actually ended up, we also have been using is the NHS Pillar 2, which is a, a, a test and trace uh, 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 systems that would actually uh, store all the information of the the people who actually have tested positive and we can actually get information from them so that uh, we can actually go and contact those patients directly and, and, and try to enroll them there from there. Next slide, please. So, uh, and, and then can you maybe just go to also click, thank you. And then, so when we're assessing the eligibility, so what happened before was that we actually had to contact the patient and can contact the GP practice and ask the GP about the getting the sort of mode of the medical summary. But it does actually take a lot of time and it means that the longer that we're going to wait for the, the reply from the GP, the more the less likely the patient becoming eligible to be part of the page, uh, of the trial. So we have to speed up that process. So the other things that we ended up doing also that we're actually using the having get, getting access of the uh, summary record form will actually be able for us the the clinical team in the uh, in in the, in the CTU would be able to do the direct access and look at what's you know the, whether the patient can actually clinically be. Uh, 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 eligible or not. So we don't really need to have to go directly to the GP. Um, we, we can actually just access those information directly from the system. Uh, but of course, this is all have to be done within the agreement, etc., and how the data is being used. So we do actually manage that the data can actually be, about, it covers about 95% of the patients in, in, in England, so that there are also ones that we wouldn't be able to use due to the opt-out system, and that's fine then we will actually go back to the GP and ask for information. So we still have to rely on that route, but not sort of entirely. Next slide, please. And then can you click again? So the other things that we also do during the follow-up is what most of the people would usually get access to is having the data from the uh, NHS Digital, having the sort of like the HES data, the civil registration data to collect the, uh, the, the, the outcomes. So we actually also have been using that but apart from having the uh, the patients fill the diary, but also that we're getting data from the the uh, the RCGP uh, surveillance centre, but also that we're getting data from the NHS Digital. But the reason that 
that um, uh, Matt had mentioned uh, in his uh, 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 presentation that is about sort of like trying to get the best data that we can. I mean, one of the blessings of having sort of like uh, a lockdown is people do actually fill out their diary quite well, uh, I have to say. Uh, next slide, please. So this is actually what happened. It's just a very busy slide shows you that, you know, how the recruitment routes are actually happening over sort of like the duration of the trial. And you can see the black bits is where the NHS digital, the pillar two data that's come in. So we have to call the patients, uh, the, the people, and then they will have to actively, you know, go onto the line on, online and, and screen themselves. And that is the number that we get. Next slide. But if you're looking at sort of like how the recruitment that really, really picks up. So this is sort of like the recruitment that the, the people who have been randomized. And you can see that the slice that's, you know, what we have actually been using a lot of different routes is probably the best route that we have actually used is the pillar two. That's actually give us the most recruitment. Next slide, please. So you can see this is where I was trying to sort of like giving you a comparison of the conversion rate. You can see that sort of like 38% of the paper people that have actually we screened and have actually ended up being randomized. So this is actually sort of like one of the best route of recruitment that we've actually have done. Next slide. So um, this is again showing you how the, day, the difference between that you know when we, before we have the the SCR access versus the ones that we then we have the access. You can see how we can manage to shorten the time of the durations so that we can actually randomize these people as quicker. I mean, I think that you know when you see the people's not randomized, uh, other people who are actually taking longer and to, to, to get the medical data to come back. And that is why that, uh, you know, having the SCR data access actually helps because we can basically randomize somebody who run the same day and they registered. And also we can actually pay, you know, to, to also to dispense the drug, to, you know, send the drug out to them on the same day as well. Next slide. And this is just to show you that, you know, sort of like the data that we get back from the late data linkage and, you know, the death data, it might look a bit a lot, but we do actually have a very small number of people who actually, you know, died from the trial. Next slide. And this is just a sort of like a summary to show you that, you know, how the data that how we actually, you know, the way that how we've changed, done the design have actually changed the whole thing. Uh, of how we actually randomize, how we actually recruit people and run the trials in primary care. Next slide. Uh, this is just to show you that sort of like the number of GPs have been randomized people to principal. Next slide. And, and this is just the more drugs that we've used and publications. Next slide. Okay, and this is just like the new trial, which is what we've learned. And uh, we have actually now randomized 16,000 people and we just started randomizing from the 8th of December. So it's actually quite remarkable what we've learned from principle to now we've done this trials. Next slide. Um, this is just a very quick way to say the thank you to, you know, the HS Digital have been actually been really, really helpful. And in terms of helping us to, you know, get to, to get where we are now. Uh, and if you want to know more information, what sort of services they provide, you can go onto the uh, website. Next slide. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, th this is just a sort of like saying that, uh, uh, um, you know, it has actually played the vital parts, parts, but we do actually have a lot of people who actually and a lot of partnerships involved, but at the same time that hopefully that in future, you know, that's something that we actually learn more about it in terms of how we can actually run the efficient trials design in uh, versus the information governance side that we need to sort of like get through as well as having the patient's view about, you know, accessing this information. Thank you. Thank you, Limi. Thank you very much. So two really interesting studies there. I know most of you out there would have a, a, a good sense, I'm sure already, of the the, the the key example trials in cardiovascular area, that use routine data. That's why I wanted to emphasize a couple of trials from, from outside of this area. One that's really picked up on outcome measures, one that's really picked up on the recruitment side of things. So we've got time for a couple of questions. Uh, so Alex, you talked a little bit about um, the need for adjudication and the use of adjudication. Uh, I think you went back to patient notes. Do you think there's, from what you've learned, if you were to be repeating uh, UK CTOX now, do you think you could get away with not having an adjudication committee? What's, uh, what do you think the role is going forward? 
I think if there was comprehensive data that you could get from all the registers and from all the uh, uh, audits, uh, anchors data that will give you and map out the patient pathway, will provide the stage and grade data, will give you the reclassification according to the latest uh, uh, WHO or FIGO uh, classifications, then I guess you could. I'm not sure we are there yet. There, there are huge improvements in the uh, NCRS data and the national data, but I think that we might still have to do a pilot and compare what may happen in the future uh, before we uh, abandon the gold standard. No, it's really interesting. So you know, the, 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 I think the role of adjudication committees has been particularly important in cardiovascular trials. And um, so the, maybe the challenge that you put out there then is about getting more data sets onboarded or, or a, a greater depth to the data sets that are available in healthcare systems data. I think that, that becomes quite important. Uh, and Limi, firstly, happy birthday to the principal trial. Um, the quite an, a, an apt day for us to be here, I guess, uh, for that. Uh, so th I think you know, you've obviously managed to access the data the, here and you've been getting data very quickly to support recruitment. So I mentioned many people in the community have a sense that getting data can take years to get approval. What sort of lessons have you learned that could help people access routinely collected health data for future trials? Is it, we hear that doors were open for COVID-19 trials. Did you did you feel that? And do you think they're actually open for, for all trials going forward? I, I think so, especially the, um, the, the summary care uh, screening data that we've got, that uh, the summary data that we've got, which is something which is quite unique that we have access to that is not normally being used. But I think that we were actually able to use it in a very controlled way. And, and I think that, yes, it does actually help, you know, in, you know, in the circumstances that we would be able to get through a lot of these uh, uh, hoops. But I think that the best thing is probably is to get yourself sort of like more engaged with the NHS digital of what you actually want to do first is, you know, mm -hmm. getting it, you know, getting them involved because they're actually very, very helpful and trying to make sure that things are being done in a very uh, uh, um, sort of like uh, you know, that you would actually need to pass all these information governance, but, you know, all the things that you haven't actually thought through, they would probably help you to think a bit more. But at the same time is that uh, also that you would actually need to make sure that they would be able to give them a timeline that you were, when you would actually like to have it, et cetera. Yes, it does actually, it takes a lot of effort to do a lot of emails and, you know, and meetings. I'm sure the team had been sort of like been marvellous. And I think that, uh, you know, in future, I would like to see there's more of, you know, this sort of like access of the data that would be able to run trials more efficiently. Um, that's what probably, you know, if we could actually run something like this, you know, in two years, uh, or even like 100 days, which is what panoramic is going to be tomorrow, then, you know, hopefully, you know, we can actually run trials, you know, much quicker and much larger in future as well. So 16,000 patients in panoramic already, that's a remarkably uh, high number, isn't it? Are you doing things different with regards to routine data in terms of recruitment or in terms of, are you using routine data for follow-up at all in, in the panoramic study? Yes, we, we very, I think that uh, panoramic is even more that we have to re rely a lot more because I think, as I said before, one of the best best uh, blessing in disguise that, so, you know, people in lockdown, they just felt with the diaries, so it's easier. But I think now that uh, a lot of people, you know, but we, we're actually, you know, do actually need to rely on much more on the diary data, uh, on the, the data coming from the NHS digital, because the primary outcome is going to be hospitalization. So that information is much vital. And what, we, what we've been now doing is going to also going to the other devolved nation and trying to get this data in quickly as well. So, I, I, I mean, I think it, yes, that's been very helpful from the NHS Digital and all the other devolved nations who are trying to provide to get us through to those application stage, which could be quite painful, as you all know. I, I like what you've done there. It, what you've done is, is, is really focus on a practical outcome measure that's achievable from the data sets that are available. And that really uh, that fits well as a concept with some of the discussions that we've been having around the, the score CVD groups. So maybe it's a final question to Alex. Amy talked about they're about to reach out to some of the devolved nations. 
you, you showed us in UKC talks, you've managed to get um, data sets, multiple data sets from all four nations. Um, do you have any advice or guidance you give anybody in, in, in building or maintaining relationships in, uh, when you go beyond NHS Digital? NHS Digital is, of course, the biggest player. What was your experience of getting data in the devolved nations? Maybe I can start. Um, so I think when we, uh, so we didn't have uh, any centres in Scotland, so I can't comment on Scotland. For Northern Ireland, uh, and there was a, a separate uh, cancer registry and uh, death uh, notification uh, register that we uh, approached. And I think with most of those things, there is the timeliness uh, in the application, establishing those contacts and uh, in in, in a way, uh, uh, just being persistent with the time that it takes to really learn where to go to, who do you apply to, and how do you uh, get the data. There, are, there is a lead uh, time to get to some of this data, but I think it's persistence, and I think it's persistence from uh, Andy Ran more than anyone else uh, uh, in uh, uh, in the team. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's great. Everybody needs an Andy Ryan, right? Uh, and I think that's effectively the case. Every place needs a little hand holding in how they get the data and a little guidance. We need to make sure that's available. And I think that's a, an important message for us to end this session on. If I may thank Alex and Liamy for great presentations, really good discussion. It's time for tea break. Uh, I'd like to see you all back here at three o'clock where Kathy will be back in the chair. We'll be having a session on, on uh, phenomics, on wearables and on cohorts. Go boil your kettles. We'll see you again very shortly. Bye now.